and welcome to our third uh, lecture on the series of the, the figure. We are celebrating the figure with the exhibition that we have of upstairs and also at McGuinness of the work of Philip Perlstein. And of course, we cannot miss architecture. Why? Because architecture, in essence, is the mother of all art. Therefore, we have to have a lecture about architecture and the figure. And who's better than Tony Biscardi? And Professor Biscardi is going to talk to us today about architecture and the human figure. Here we are. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> interesting because you know normally the human figure whatever can explain as a proportional tool. You know, we have the famous Renaissance man and Corbu has his man and everybody has all these figures that they use mostly for proportion and based on things that, that in architecture we call anthropometrics, meaning how do I make a piece of furniture so you sit down for so on. But I told, I told Ricardo that that's not really what I want to speak about because uh, the way I've used the body in architecture, and I think also Anne Priester when she talks about uh, the human figure in art, she's going to touch on the more traditional ways of talking about the body uh, in, in art proportionally. But, you know, Perlstein in his work uh, really looked at the body uh, almost disconnected from the human that inhabited it. It was really an object for him. And he said that, you know, he said, I really don't, I place the bodies in, in along with these other objects and they kind of form this uh, living still life, which is, I guess, an oxymoron, uh, that he paints. And I, in a way, want to talk about that a little bit today because I want to talk about the body more so like an object, but even more so as a machine. The reason I say that is because uh, we tend to use the body as a, as a way to understand the world, you know, so we, uh, when we're a little child and learning how to walk, we use uh, our body to negotiate uh, forces like gravity and, and balance and all those things. We even start, you know, we start to discover our hands, uh, we start to realize our hands are actually attached to our body. Uh, and then all of a sudden the hand becomes somewhat of a tool and, and we progress and progress and, uh, to the point where the body is a very, very good machine to understand the world. And what I mean by that is that a uh, uh, okay. demonstration, okay. Uh, just face stand looking that way, let's lean against each other. So if we lean against each other, First of all, we have to trust that we're not going to fall back, but we're both going to step back. So you step out, leaning your back to me. So as we step out, we're forming a, a living arch. You know, and if I push back, she goes, oh, she pushes back a little bit. Okay, stand up. So, oh, thank you. So we use our bodies to kind of understand the structural dynamics of things. Thank you, Heidi, I didn't mean to embarrass you. <laughs> but, uh, and in architecture, I'm constantly referring to the body to have my students understand how things work. Um, and so I put this first slide up because we're kind of strange uh, things in this world. We're kind of half, we're kind of like minute, uh, what are they called? Uh, what are those things that are half animal, half human? Uh, centaurs. centaurs. You know, we have this kind of body with a head that we analyze the world and geometricize it and do all that stuff. And then we have this other part that's trying to be with nature, but really feels out of place because we can't quite understand nature for what it really is, but we intellectualize it into this other realm. So this constant conflict between being with nature and being intellectualizing nature, you know? And so the body to me works in a way, in a way like that, where we use the body to understand certain elements. Now, these images, I'm not sure they're ex exact source, but I took them from Diderot's uh, uh, catalog. But, you know, we start to look at the body as something that, again, isn't just something that's fixed. And the problem I always have with how architects refer to the body, it's always something standing still. And it's, but the body is not still. The body is constantly in motion. It's constantly doing this, which is this amazing feat of defying gravity as 
Laurie Anderson describes it, we're falling and catching ourselves from falling. And it's pretty amazing that we do those things. You know? So it's really it's kind of an interesting machine. And the, uh, the body obviously is made up of muscles and bones. Now, in, in, in trying to understand structure, it's very easy to use it as, as an example because the bones are usually in compression, the muscles are in tension, and they work together to form the direct and indirect muscles that make our body work. So it's kind of like uh, if I were to have two bulls, well, I'll have an example in a second. But we, we very easily can understand uh, mechanics by understanding the body, so particularly the hand. The hand's a pretty amazing thing when you think about how it works. Um, what I usually have my students do at the beginning of this project that I'm going to explain is to draw the body, because to me, uh, all students of, of, of art or architecture or humanity should understand the figure. Figure drawing is an important aspect of that. Not just because you're understanding the proportions, which is one of it, but also just understanding the mechanics of how it moves, how a body lays, how it stands, how it sits. And so initially the students are uh, studying the body in terms of drawing and collages and trying to form a way to understand some, uh, some of the biological aspects of the body. In particular, the arm. We look at the arm. The reason I picked the arm uh, rather than the leg, because uh, the arm has the hand, okay? and the hand is a really important element when we start extending it into the realm of architecture. Anything because it attaches to your back, the scapula attaches to you. No matter what you, have, you do with your arm, it pulls your body with you. So what it ends up creating are these very interesting dynamic cantilevers. So what this, this illustrates here in this top image over here, I'm like a little fancy corner here. This image there, uh, it's the way this indirect and direct muscles work. You know, the, you have the bones, you have the muscles, the tendons holding it together. If I pull it out, the spring back. Now here it talks a little differently because it talks about indirect muscles, like the bicep. The bicep lays over this bone here, but it's really attached to the bone down here. So when it's being flexed, it's getting the muscle, to, the, the arm to work through an indirect action. So there's a lot of these things, that, and a good example of uh, the indirect action is kind of like me standing up. And for me to stand up, there's a lot of muscles in opposition. Just the way you would see if you were ever putting up a tent or saw a high tension radio tower. There's these cables that are working in a tensegrity way to hold the system together. So I really want to look at the body today as a system, as a, and particularly the arm, uh, as a machine. Because again, I'm not talking about in this particular talk about the body as a complete entity. I'm really talking about the dismembered body. And so that you can look at certain aspects of it and gain a sense of structural, uh, a sense of structure that has life, so to speak. You know, because you know, sometimes when structures, if, if structures talk, no offense, through engineering, it's taught through numbers and kind of a top-down thing of you figure out calculus and structural a modulus and blah, blah, blah. But if you understand structure in terms of the body, it's really easy because, you know, we lean like this, which is a buttress. We can do this, which is pretty amazing, which is an extended cantilever, but it's a dynamic cantilever. We can do these things. All these things which seem like children's uh, activities are the things that we learn the dynamics of the body through. Da Vinci is one of my heroes because he saw no boundary between anything. To him, the world was a system of, of intriguing curiosities that he then tried to formulate some analogy or simulations to, to use what he knows to create something he doesn't know. And that's exactly what I try to do in my studio, is really it's more of a pedagogy of wonder. How do I get the students to learn through a process of design research? How do they discover things that relate to something else and analogically? Uh, so they make these collages in this, in this particular project, which is called Arms, Wings, and Mechanical Things. We start out by looking at the arm. And then I quickly make an analogy to the wing. Now you might say, why the wing? You know, uh, well, the thing about a wing, and particularly a bat's wing, every, you know, and even though they're ugly little creatures, they're one of the most beautiful things to use as an analogy, uh, because wings come with panels. Now in architecture, you have structural systems and you have enclosing systems. Well, wings come with the enclosing system. So, you know, they pull it out and all of a sudden the enclosure is already there. So if you try to make the analogy now between the arm and the wing, what you're starting to see is how the wing incorporates 
all the movements in the muscles and the bones, but also uh, enclosure. You can see this comparison between a skeleton of a human and a skeleton of a bat. I mean, it's kind of weird, you know, but it's not that much different, you know. <laughs> you know and it's kind of a strange thing. Proportions are off. Very weird pelvis. Uh, but the most intriguing one is this one here, because what this is showing is that the hand is actually an extension into the wing. So you get these are the, are the four fingers, or the fifth finger, yeah, the thumb, which goes up to the, I'm gonna get my little thing again. I'm not used to uh, the thumb, which is pretty amazing. But each one of these is an, is an analogy or a simulation of the finger. So when the arm opens up, it's very similar to some of the things that Da Vinci was dealing with when he was trying to make wings, make flying machines. Uh, so it's very simple and easy for the student to see the relation between the arm or the hand and a wing. I have them, I have to go back. So one of the first things I have students do after they've done a study of the arm is actually to pick a wing and draw it really, really well. As far as I'm concerned, drawing is the ability to see. And drawing with your hand is this connection that you get. You're really understanding the slight nuances of a wing uh, by slowly drawing it really large in pencil. So, and it also, from, in my point of view, unleashes the daydream. Meaning when you're drawing something and shading, your mind tends to wander. And it wanders into areas that are leading to this next step. Because what the next step in this thing, well, let me show you some more of these joints first. Because again, it's a technique they learned earlier in drawing of blowing something up to grids. But they're using pencil to really see every, every nuance of the wing, to understand how this wing is different than this wing. Okay. And how, the, how does the bird, because a bird more than a, more than a human being, can achieve an amazing cantilever, an amazing dynamic cantilever. You know, some of these birds, uh, Vultures, in particular, have a wingspan of almost six feet. It's just incredible they can do it. Of course, the next thing is mechanical things, because I go from arms and wings to mechanical things. And mechanical things, obviously, we've been emulating the body when it comes, you know, well, I put these in there because we talk about wings. These are the cars that had the best wings. And I think the cars of the 50s, 60s, really were the most expressive in terms of trying to capture the voluptuousness voluptuousness, whatever the word is, of the body, but also this nature of the wing, of flying, of, of, of releasing yourself from gravity, basically. So the students, after they've made two collages, now make a machine collage, trying to make relationships between uh, their earlier studies and machines that they see in the world. And there's tons of them. And the most important one that we have in our face all the time is the steel plant. The steel plant, to me, is a perfect example, or well, it is the example of the Industrial Revolution, where we were in a period of emulating the body in terms of its late, the body as, a, as labor. And so everything that's going on at the steel plant and most machines in the Industrial Revolution, we're all fashioning uh, things after understanding the body, but the body as a machine of labor. Now we're in an era of the information age and all we are thinking about is the head. So now we are in a, in a realm of bodiless architecture. Architecture that's coming along that's purely virtual. We don't really need the body. The body eventually will atrophy and you can have simulations of the body. But I think you know we've gone from one one realm of thinking in terms of the body as a machine and creating things as incredibly beautiful as a steel plant to now where machines are really more uh, virtual, uh, which I miss a little bit because I, I like sensual things. So anyway, let me go through a little bit, and that I've given you a little bit of the introduction, let me go through a few examples of this project that I do that's called Arms and Wings and Mechanical Things that will kind of bring you through a series of uh, uh, operations that I do with the students. Like I said, first they do drawings of as is. And like anything in architecture, if you go to a site, the first thing, or anything, if the, whenever you go to something new or you're doing design research, the first thing you do is to observe and observing is a very important thing to do. It's not easy to do, you have to see. And in the process of observing, you document. So that's what these drawings are about. You're documenting the actual thing, the drawing as is. 
And then I have them do a drawing, which I call drawing as ad, which basically is an abstraction, because again, we as human beings tend to geometricize everything. And when we geometricize it, we can then make simulations of it. So they take these drawings and they do simulations, or not simulations, they do abstractions that, that take what they're seeing here and draw it in terms of cylinders, rectangles, cones, uh, so that they're kind of uh, taking the body in the wing, like this one here, and actually seeing it as a machine. And how do I start to simulate some of the muscles and tendons into an actual construction. But they haven't done that yet. This is really the abstraction. It's in this drawing here that they start to actually look at simulations of the wing, which came from the arm, which came from the body. And here they're doing little constructive drawings that kind of give you a sense of how they're slowly doing this movement. Now, like in most of my studios, I have to really prevent them from seeing the end. And so therefore, I have to have the students suspend disbelief for a while and not try to figure out what am I doing this for or what's the end goal, because I'm trying to get them to build things up incrementally and see each element. So in this one here, they're starting now to make little tinkering things and eventually making some of their first simulations. Now, the simulations are, a simulacrum is a very interesting thing, and Gordon and I have been talking a lot about it in our class, but it's something that somewhat resembles the thing you're simulating, but actually has the power of its own to take on greater meaning. Uh, in other words, it's released from the contract of the wing, even though it comes from the wing, and is allowed to do some things that go beyond the actual wing. So here you're seeing uh, a simulation of the wing. Uh, here you're seeing another simulation of the eagle's wing. And eventually, in this particular piece, we appropriated some of these ideas. We did it an intervention for the uh, 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 Unitarian Universalist Church where they wanted to put something new and something old. So we used some of his earlier designs to actually create this inner structure for the, for the church. As well as, you know, some of these elements. And the and thing is, I have to postpone the application because students immediately want to apply their ideas before you've really explored the, the, the ability for the machine to develop. But here you can see how this simple device that was a wing device ends up becoming something that could become a, a parasitic kind of intervention where it attaches to a wall or, or becomes a system within itself, or actually deforms the wall. So you know we can get these elements that once they work out to actually deform the nature of the wall. This was a project based on a pterodactyl wing where she started to deal with the, uh, the notion of the wing in terms of its ability to bend, and then eventually she applied it to this pavilion. The beautiful thing about this pavilion, and no offense from Amy, to Amy, is that we tend to design architecture, but then we have to design furniture to fit within the architecture. So we ask the question, can the architecture be the furniture? You know, so in this particular case, the floor, just the way this piece before, uh, the way this moves up on this bracket, uh, in this piece, the, actually the part in the floor folds up to become a seat, or the wall falls down to be somewhere to hang on, the ceiling opens up and down. So I try to get them to start to think about structures that are dynamic, and therefore it starts to lend a temporary architecture and uh, nomadic architecture. This particular piece was based on the uh, uh, hummingbird, which is a flipping device, they were a swinging device, and they end up, after we end up dealing with the individual element, we deal with multiples of it, because in architecture, we, architecture we're always dealing with bays, we create these bays that we take one thing and multiply. And, but basically it comes from the idea of growth, which goes back to the body. The body multiplies through division, and in this particular case, you can take one particular element, which was uh, this one here, and then she multiplied it to become this one here around three axes, and then eventually applied it with the panel system where she came up with these systems that could be opened or closed. And then again, the application to my, in this particular case comes last, because I want this discovery process to continue. And then I have them drawing with pencil on mylar. And that's the other reason I have them drawing, you know, one of the reasons I have them drawing on pencil on mylar is that it picks up the memory of your hand, because when you're drawing with pencil on mylar, it smears. 
and that smear buildup kind of occurs through the process of drawing, so you're actually feeling your hand. And then you can go back and erase in it. So the drawing tends to have this palimpsest sense to it, and it incorporates some of the action of, of what you, you, what you had earlier. Uh, I want to bring you through this particular student's work. I thought it was a beautiful drawing of a wing, but then again, he made these simulations. And then from the initial simulation, we jump to the analog. Now the analog, in my mind, is something that can either take a particular aspect of the simulation, a small detail, a small part of it, and now extend it, but no longer worry about the resemblance to its original uh, uh, object. So here, by taking this, uh, by taking uh, this individual element and, and multiplying it around one axis, he gets a movement that deals with some of these joints and details here that creates this device. And then by putting it around two axes, he all of a sudden gets a system that can move and slide and, and start to change form. But it all came incrementally. You know, when you look at these things, it wasn't the kind of thing that, at this point, he didn't know that point. You can't. You have to slowly build up to it. You slowly are making little kind of jumps from one piece to the other until you get a system that's really complex. In this case, it dealt with the idea of the eagle wings, and eagle, eagle wings tend to overlap each other like shingles. So they become like fans. So you're really starting to deal with the notion of fanning and making some other parts that deal with the accordion of the fan. But eventually came up with this device, which uh, became an element which again is the analog. It no longer had to look like the original simulation. Now it has a life of its own as an analog, and then that analog can be applied to structural issues. If this was a, a nomadic piece of architecture, the mechanical systems could be here, and this piece could open up to form several different configurations. Uh, if you had this one, which is more introverted, you then could create space to having them work together. So there's a lot of things that happen. But again, it's still dealing with the body. This one, he took the wing when the bat is hanging upside down, so gravity became an element in it. So his device dealt with pushing the elements as if it were the way the gravity would fall. And then eventually he made the machine where all these, these, I mean, because one of the nicest things about this thing was this device here, where you push these elements, these sticks from the outside, and it manipulates the, the change of the form on the inside. So he ended up making a cube where these elements could create different profiles inside of the cube. And then we start, you know, these then become vehicles for us to discuss the body of architecture, meaning how could this thing relate to becoming a piece of architecture? Now, in most pieces of architecture, especially energy efficient architecture, you tend to design it where it's a passive machine, meaning the sun moves and the building stands still, but it's animated through light. What we started to talk about here is what if the actual body of the machine could change to adapt to the exterior conditions? And again, it's always based on this what if question. What if you made this incredible machine? And for me, the success of this is not even, I don't even care what the things do, the amount of detail they put into each joint and connection is really what I'm going for. I'm wanting them to understand the mechanics and the craft of an object, and if they can even get near what the body does, then they'll be, you know, fantastic. But again, you can create all kinds of manipulations here in terms of the machine. This one is another one, I'll just go through a few more examples of how the machine is used, and then the machine gets multiplied in terms of systems where it got, ends up taking out a life of its own to where you eventually have a fairly complex system. And it's at this point that I'll usually ask the student, what does it want to be? And we start talking about the roof systems and mechanical systems. So, so in a way, I'm backloading. After they've made several discoveries, I backloaded with several things that they can apply it to. And eventually, his final piece was this piece here that actually went up and down based on the movement. Kind of piece. But all of this stuff here, I mean, the success in it is goes back to the arm in terms of the muscles and the tendons and the bones. You know, so if all these came from just trying to discover, understand the simple thing of, of, of the arm. And you can see how in architecture today it's used all over the place. You know, dynamic roof systems are fairly prevalent. This one I thought was fantastic because it just had a life of its own. It started as a simple thing looking at an owl or something. And then again, once you started to multiply it, it gained all of its, well, let me go back, it gained, uh, oops, it gained all of its dynamics. 
This one here, this is Dan Cook, and Dan Cook did some really interesting because he was a drummer, so he took the action of his hand with a drumstick, and then he applied it to a dragonfly's wing, and then he ended up looking at some machines that are, you know, fairly obvious, but then he got involved with the tail, which is really interesting because sometimes what happens when you're looking at a body, you know, again, we've shifted from the human body to an insect's body, but in this one, he was really enamored by the segmentation of the tail, but also how the insect buried its head into the kind of its, into the anchored itself here to allow this cantilever to occur, which I thought was really interesting. And so we ended up designing this really beautiful machine here that works in a very interesting way because of this element here. Because of when this element comes down, it actually presses on this thing to cause the string to flip that element in position where then it stays in its kind of fixed position. You know? And uh, you know, when, when they're doing these things, of course, I'm having millions of ideas, and I'm still thinking, I'm hoping one day that we'll be able to turn the hallways in Chandler Allman into these dynamic galleries where we have these devices that move them down. And, you know, who knows? I may eventually work with Ricardo with having the students make portable or exhibit, exhibit uh, designs that you can bring to a space to accommodate the art. So, but again, these are all the afterthoughts. I'm more concerned with them evolving the process. So after he did this, I mean, this particular thing which dealt with the one element, he started to, oops, I uh, got it going again, you're going to have to watch it. <laughs> no, I guess it's not. Okay, so he started to multiply and deal with this kind of asymmetry of the movement, uh, where it started to make these machines that I, they look like they're walking machines. And for me, I kind of have a little bit too much of Monty Python stuck in me, because I keep thinking buildings can walk, uh, you know, and we as human beings don't really stay in one place anywhere anyway, so you might as well get some devices that you can hang on your body, and if I like that spot, I can expand it out and be there. Or if I like a person, we knock these and something inflates around us, you know, because we don't really stay in one place. We don't even need office places anymore because we work wherever we are with our, all those initial things, MPBs and GMGs and all these things that are hooked all around you. So you can be in the middle of the piazza and in Rome, like that one commercial, and talking and doing your business. So, to me, the work sphere has changed, and all of this is dealing with that kind of idea. How do we start to apply architecture now back to the body as something that becomes like a prosthetic extension of the body, but now as a home? Because if we went from the body to the clothes, and the clothes are our first extension, maybe now technology is bringing us full circle back to things being light and attachable to our body, just the way we wear backpacks that you could eventually have things that work. But anyway, I'm off on a tangent. This thing here ended up becoming now, when you multiply it, obviously it can become a fairly dynamic system. Uh, with Photoshop, we can you know, extrapolate it into you know, uh, another horizon. It's always good at this stage to bring people in like Tom Peters, because he can look at this as a structural system completely different than I would look at it, and probably tell me it doesn't work, but still he gives me all the, you know, an interesting input on it. Uh, and then they start to just ask the what if question. What if it's a bridge? What if it's this? I had them do 100 drawings of what if questions. And they end up thinking about things. This one was uh, Pam Lee, and she also did the dragonfly wing. This was her simulation. But her project ended up becoming really extrapolated because then she took the wing, not the. And so rather than taking the structure, she actually took the wing. And in the wing, in this division of the wing, she created this beautiful machine here that deform goes from a square that deforms into all these shapes and these beautiful joints. And then we went into the third dimension and she made this construction that's overwhelmingly amazing. And now we're still working on it in terms of cladding the outside of it and extending it in length so that it could actually be some kind of temporary structure that also tracks the sun and those things like that. A lot of this goes back to a project that I did a long time ago with the uh, Brockle School kids, I think it was, with Diane LaBelle, we had, we had to think of Parker kids. But we, at that time, really studied the hand and uh, had the students make things directly related to the hand and then made simulations. Mike Johnson made this little thing dealing with the radius and the ulna. But in the end, I thought it actually did more than the radius and ulna. I hate to say that and I don't offend anybody, but it, you know, it did some great things, but it created a vocabulary in this stuff here that allowed us to make this entire installation uh, with large memories. And again, what this does is bring me back to the body because it deals with labor. And I think when students have to work with their body and they have to hone material and they have to work with teams to get things up, 
then you really understand the body. You really understand what you need to do to get something to work. And again, once you get this connection with your body, whenever you can't understand anything, because I didn't do well in structures, I didn't do it well in mechanical systems, but then when I started my own practice and started to build my own stuff and rely on things like my body, it all came about. So this was a project we did that extended this metaphor of the body into a full-scale construction. And, uh, and then we also built a wall in our studio, which again dealt with the idea of the relationship of parts. And it has to do with everything, you know, when, when I talk to my students about scale and proportion, which are terms that came from the body. We don't, you know, the only reason uh, this thing looks the size as it is, is because my body's this big. But to this person here, this is much bigger. You know, so this is a much bigger structure to her than it is to me. And that deals with structure and proportion and scale. And so the body becomes, you know, in order, when you build, you start to realize those elements of stuff. Uh, that's it, I think. <laughs> you have any questions? <laughs>
it's still not accommodating the body the way I think it could. I think when we go in tents and things like that, we sense more of the architecture in relation to our body because it's, it's not, first of all, it's not rectangular. For me, uh, I think one of the really strongest uh, memories I have that made me want to be an architect was when I went to a friend of mine's house who lived in an attic, he had his room in the attic. So all of a sudden, I could sit in the corner and the roof beam was going way up. So all of a sudden, space became physical. You know, it wasn't this cerebral thing that I've got to have squares. It actually felt like it was touching my body. And so I think architecture uh, relates to the body, but it's always been this kind of abstract, proportional thing. And then we use that part of the senator that's the brain and say, OK, we understand nature through abstract geometry, which I agree, I do too. But I really feel like this stuff here, you can clearly see the memory of the hand in this stuff here. But in most of our architecture, you don't see the memory in. And even more so now, with the computer, we're starting to lose a sense of the craft and the texture and the smell and the feel of architecture because we do it on a virtual screen. And it looks fine, but actually when you go to build the architecture, just like building anything, it picks up the memory of your body. You know, so, so I guess what I, in answer to your question, yes, we go to architecture, but it would be very interesting from my point of view, and I try to explore it with my students, of how the body, how do we, like rather than calling these things furniture, wouldn't it be interesting if we said, we're gonna do something to house the body? How do we house the body, you know? And we house the body to, in different ways, you know, this is housing the body if I sit like this, but I also sit like this a lot of times, you know, like the, all this sort of stuff. But I'm having to accommodate some myself to the chair. So what if all of a sudden the architecture, if I was having a conversation with someone getting done, I could just slide something down and start to take the form of my body. And that's kind of where I'm interested. Uh, I think the other part that I haven't hit on, and if, you know, if Ivan was talking right now, we talk about the Corbusier and proportions and, and the mindset of the architect when you create something visually to look at. But from my point of view, the new architecture, excuse me, deals with the fourth dimension of time and because we move through, you know, we're constantly moving through it. We don't stand still and experience architecture, we're constantly moving through it. So it lends itself to an idea that the body in motion is really the new paradigm rather than the frozen body. I don't know if that's the answer. Oh God. So so this, <laughs> and so, so this thing, it's um um uh, it's, uh I guess this is the Kabuzier thing. Like he he says, so long as we're trying to fly by building things that look like like birds' wings, it didn't work. And once we, because that what that's not the way to fly. You have to take the you have to sort of define the problem you know, in a more specific way. Uh, lift, I don't know what something about. Wings, but not make it look like a bird. Because the first, the first planes that really worked didn't look like right. birds, and the, all the ones look like birds crash. Um, so what I'm wondering is, and you've gone back to the birds because you go back to those failed attempts to fly of Leonardo. And so I'm wondering whether there's some element of loving the pointless exploration of these uh, glorious nat organic systems that. Is disconnected from their function that gives that gives your students the f space to make something new because uh, Leonardo, genius as he was, was a disaster as an airplane designer. Well, I think that, I think the, the thing comes is that every one of those explorations had an end goal in mind. So he was doing all this stuff to make the machine to fly. I'm not. What I the first thing we do is a simulation. So that's more like a Leonardo. We simulate the wing. It looks like the wing of the, it's the analog that jumps off. The analog is allowed to take any aspect that you've discovered in the wing to develop a particular joint or detail that then once that joint or detail has been released from its contract with the simulation, it can go on and become a lot of things, just through multiplication. So it's not so much that I'm studying the arm to make a better arm. No, that, no, that, that that's what I, yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's what it seems like. It's like the, there is something the functionless, pointless, yeah, functionlessness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at that moment when you say find a detail, it's like forget the damn thing as a right. wing. Right. right. Um, Just see it as this dynamic system that, you know, I can put words on it. And again, you know, uh, I can talk to Tom about it. We can talk about corbelling and, you know, asymmetrical arches and blah, 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 all that stuff. That's in the word of the structural engineer. But really, in terms of the students, it's really just trying to figure out how these things work 
how to get, because a lot of them use rubber bands because the rubber band becomes the involuntary muscle band, and through touch. So I think a lot of the discovery in this course comes through touch and it comes through failure. You know, so they're trying something and fails, they try another thing. But I think you're right, it's because I've released them from the initial idea of creating a better wing, but looking at the wing as a body of parts and how those body of parts then can be analogically taken away from its source and applied to something else. But that's why I try to keep the application at bay as long as I can until we've developed this thing as far as we can go. Um, you spoke a little bit about the about applying geometry to the natural environment and sort of how humans just sort of do this naturally. And, um, and then a little bit about how uh, how how you do that and how you know how you push the students to that anyway um, is that keeping um, architecture sort of as these things that don't react to human beings is that um, applied geometry that isn't really um, a reality about our bodies well is well I think I think the that? reason I have to do it is because I can't get around the fact that we fashion things meaning. I take a tree and I fashion it into a buildable object that I can nail together. You know, so, but I could also take a, a thin tree, climb up it, let my weight pull it down, have two people and tie it together, which people say was the origin of architecture, so, so forth, or a, a grove of trees that represent a cathedral. I think the reason uh, the geometry is placed there, and again, it's kind of opposite of what I'm saying, is that it becomes something they can build. Okay, so. And even when I, ha I showed you the one wing that I had a student, a French Canadian, who built ducks with his father. So he had all these machines and he wanted to curve everything to really look too much like the body. Because I'm trying to pull away from fashion and deal more with fashioning, taking the element and fashioning in such a way so that you can join it. And then what is the proportion or relationship of that particular element to the next element? So perhaps it takes you away from the organic, but I'm not really looking for the organic as much as I'm looking for uh, dynamics more. I, mean, I, I don't think I want them to, you know, I would love, uh, I mean, the thing that's so beautiful to me about animals, or, you know, I mean, bird, like say the weaver bird, the weaver bird really uses its beak to weave and actually pushes its body, does all these things, because it doesn't have a hand. What we do is we have a hand, we make tools, okay, so the first tool we make ends up taking us farther and farther away from just scraping with our fingers. But I think that tool is the essence of why we're homo favor, why we build. We build because we can go beyond our body and build these large things, but we always have to fashion something. Geometry becomes a thing that makes it easier. But I think you're right. I mean, I think, unfortunately, the only geometry, in the, well, the geometry we tend to deal with as architects until recently has been just Euclidean. Now, with computers being able to see, allowing us to visualize algorithms, which before that I could tell you nothing about it, really, but now I can watch it do this stuff. All of a sudden, geometry becomes uh, less uh, Euclidean, less angular, you know, which I think is good and bad. But of course, it takes. You know, I think Frank Gehry has overdone himself. He's a little too much of that, and so now we're yearning for a square, you know. So I think we go back and forth these things. I think the thing I would love my students to learn more about, and for me too, is more about animal architecture. I think animals do things from the very early termites up, where they tend to do things in an additive process, meaning even a spider web, which comes out to be a perfect grid, is done one increment at a time, and it's based on the blowing of the wind and the space around them. So there's all these things that insects and animals do uh, because they don't have the extension of making a tool. Now we have the extension of making a tool, which is a damn good thing. Now how do we take that? You know, I would love to do a class where I said to you, okay, Sam, make a tool that with that tool you have to make your house. And so the tool itself has to be the thing that fashions the building. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. No, we actually, those last projects, we built them large, because to me, when you build something large, the main thing you feel is gravity, you know. I, right now, I want to fall down. It'd be much easier for me to lay on the floor and walk than it would be to stand up. You know, so when you have to deal with uh, building something large, 
everything changes because gravity becomes a, you know, what looks great in a little model when you start making it large. It's, it's, so I try to get students as much as I can to build something large, uh, full scale. Uh, first of all, because they usually can't do it by themselves, so therefore they have to work with someone else. And that means they have to put their bodies together and work together. So it seems to work pretty good. But it's fun. I, I think, you know, everybody should build something before they die. You should build something. Whether it, I, mean, I think everybody should, the, you know, this is very communistic, but I think everybody, the government should get, give each person, each family enough money to build their house. And I think because everybody deserves to build a house. But they have to live in it one to five years. You know, so, but anyway, that's a whole other subject. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Uh, did anybody look at wings of animals that can't fly? Well, yeah, we had fish. I had one person do a uh, lizard where the fan comes out, and it, the thing about the fan and the lizard, it comes out only in the, when they're being aggressively approached, and it flips out, so he made this thing that actually flipped out. I had someone do a fighting chicken, which is really interesting, because it dealt more with how the body has to go back to kick it. You know, so it had to do with this leverage thing, which eventually dealt with the perpetual, trying to deal with a perpetual machine that created emotion and kept going. So, yeah, we've, we've done some. Yeah. Um, it's not more of a question, but more of a suggestion. I noticed that when you do all those exercises, um, it, you were quite limited in the, the choice. Um, I think, like, there, a lot of those construction were done with just a, you know, the two by fours or flat rectangles, but what if, you know, if you're, if you're like, into going the, uh, experimental then, why don't you just deprive it from that ease of using the rectangle and actually use other things? Like, for example, in nature, um, not everything is composed of rectangles, <coughs> but you also have spheres and, like, you know, those, you know, those I think the reason I think the reason is to make the first step a little simple, you know, because it's hard enough when I, and you know, some of the students who are taking the course right now could tell you when I first start the project, it's a little overwhelming, and uh, and and then when you think about how am I going to take this wing and make it into some construction? If I told them they had to use uh, uh, something like twigs, they, they, you know, it would be much more difficult. Uh, I think eventually it could evolve to that. At this point now, they're in this. We're doing this project right now in our studio. And at this point, some people now start to go beyond wood and start to think about plastic and metal and uh, other materials that are around. I think it would be quite interesting, though, to actually go to the mountaintop in that place where all the art stuff's going and actually say you need to build something from everything you can get from this tree and a 50, you know a 50 foot radius around the tree. So what you'd have to do is get what you can get and kind of inventory it and say, okay, how do I take these things? And, use them and bundle them, you know, make bundles. So I think it's a good project, and it would be a great project in the nice weather to basically say the student has to camp out there the whole semester and eventually go from living in the tent to living in the structure, whether it's on from a tree or whatever. And, you know, and based on, like, when we did the snow arches, and I was terribly misquoted, but, you know, termites make these great things because they use spitballs to make little piles of things, and then when the piles of get high enough, something clicks off in the brain and they start to look for two that are closest and they make arches and then they continue to make, they go from one operation to the next. So it's very similar to say like a Greek village where you get one or two families starting there and then the next family comes and rather than having a grid, they say, okay, we've got to have view of the church and sun for the goats and blah, blah, blah. So their building is basically arranged to an additive process where New York City is kind of this thing where you impose the grid. So you kind of have to improvise more, which is, and basically what I'm trying to get the students to do is improvise, but use their body as a source. Okay, thanks for coming.